So I just wanted to be able to say too, since I haven't said it, Happy New Year. Uh, thank you so much for joining us in the u- new year. And, and you guys understand that with a new year comes a new series. And I have decided that any series that you can start by playing Aerosmith has got to be a good series. Um, I'm just kidding. I had to look up who sang that song. I didn't know. Showing my age a little bit. My bad. But there are so many references in Scripture to this idea of walking. And that's what we're going to be looking at throughout this series. Like, be careful how you walk. Even though you walk through the shadow of death, walk in love. And today's focus, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, the path we walk is charted by faith, not by what we see with our eyes. This idea of walking by faith and not by sight. Walk by faith, not by sight. What, what, does, that, what does that mean? It's one of those things that we hear, but, but what does that look like? And I think that faith is one of those things that is reflected in our actions. And and what I mean by that is as believers, we can't just talk the talk, right? We've got to learn to walk the walk. And that that, that, that means more than just believing in God. It means that we've got to actually trust Him. So when I was in high school, I got a job at Chick-fil-A. And I worked in a Chick-fil-A in a mall because my brother said he hated the drive through so I just figured if I worked in a mall, I wouldn't have to do drive through So there we go. And so I went in to, to give my interview, and it was on the second story. And I don't know if you guys know this about fast food restaurants, but the floor is a little slippy. Okay? And so I walk in, and it's one of those things that, like, I don't know if you, you just have one of those falls and, you know, you, it's one of those things that you think only happens in movies. Oh, it happened to me. I stepped and it was greasy and my feet went above my head and landed right on my back. And the best part about this is, is that underneath the store was like a Pier 1 Imports and their manager called and said, hey man, did you guys just, could you hear that? Did you feel that? What's going on? It's like a, mighty, a little mini earthquake going on up here. So I was like, oh, I was a little embarrassed that I made the whole mall shake, but that's, that's fine. But you guys understand this. Sometimes walking's not so easy. How many of you be honest enough to say that you've tripped on air before? Yeah. More than once for me. More than once. Yeah, I mean, walking's not always easy. Sometimes there's stuff that gets in our way. Sometimes we step on grease and we slip and fall. And I kind of want to talk about a few of those things. What, what are those pitfalls of faith? What are those greasy stops that, that prevent us from walking by faith? If you have your outline, we're going to go ahead and jump into this. Now, the first one I have is just blurry vision. And and for me, that's doubt. Uh, The blank to fill in there is doubt. Sometimes we just struggle believing because we have doubts. I don't know about you, but I don't like fair rides. I just have a strong belief that roller coasters shouldn't travel. Uh, I don't, yeah, thank you. I don't know if if you've seen those things get put together, but I don't get on fair rides because I don't think that I'm going to be alive by the time the ride is over. Okay, I have doubts, so I don't, I don't get on them. You guys understand this, but sometimes doubt's not always just conceptual. Sometimes it's because of our experiences. It's because of our past. Maybe you struggle with doubt because maybe God didn't answer something in the way that you thought he should or, or he didn't answer in your timing or, or whatever it is. Or maybe you've just been hurt by people who were so-called Christians. You're like, God, these are your people? It caused you to doubt. Next one, I think, is sometimes we just start walking too fast. And I think that sometimes we just get impatient. Faith often requires patience. Steve told us last week in his, in his sermon that the, the journey of God is rarely a quick trip, right? It, it, we rarely get there super fast. Sometimes it's not in our timing, and sometimes... Because of that, it causes us to panic. And then we try to do things by our own strength. I mean, this is what happened to Abraham. I don't know about you, but if you're told that you're going to be a father and and you're starting to get super old and you're like, okay, God, (laughs) I'm starting to get old here. And so what did he do? He thought, okay, well, maybe God wants me to sleep with Hagar, Sarah's servant, and have a kid. And, And that was not a good choice. He became impatient. He sought his own way to bring about God's promises, and that that never works well for us. Another thing is sometimes we just try to walk alone. 
And for me, this is pride. And I think for me, pride is where our faith in God becomes faith in ourselves. And sometimes that just happens when life is good. It's like, okay, life's good. I don't, I don't need you today, God. But no, no, every hour we need him. This idea, I, I just, I really think it's important for you to hear this today, is that asking for help does not make you incompetent. Asking for help is actually a sign of intelligence. The next thing I, I think that sometimes it's just tripping. I mean, we kind of already talked about that, but what are we tripping over? Sin and temptation. I think sin is what we trip over, and temptation is what Satan uses to distract us from God's truth. We have an enemy that seeks to trip us up. He wants us to question God's love and his promises. He wants us to fall for the imitation. He wants us to, to distract us from real hope. With these temporary fixes and this false hope, it just leaves us down and out. And lastly, you guys understand that sometimes you're trying to walk, you just get the, you get the, the shaky leg, right? And that is fear. You know, when we have faith, having faith is about giving God control. It's about giving God our trust. But sometimes when we, when we have fear, it makes us want to take it back. It's what causes a, a dad who's teaching his child how to drive to reach over and grab the steering wheel. Like, you understand that. Like, oh yeah, I trust you to drive until you don't. Until you make one weird turn. Um, but fear also attacks our brain. I don't know if you guys know this, but they've done a lot of studies, and it's shown that anxiety literally causes your brain to swell. And so some people have a really hard time taking tests because they get anxious and they can't recall what they actually know. And there's a legitimate reason for that. And sometimes that happens in our spiritual walks as well. Sometimes that, that fear creeps in and we start getting anxious. Our brain swells. And what do we forget? We forget who God is, how powerful he is, how much he loves us, what he's done for us in our past. But what does it look like to trust God? What, is it, what does it look like to have faith? And this is the first blank to fill in on our three points here today. That is, we got to learn to take the first step. We serve, and if you, then I, God. Knock, and it will be opened. Cry, and I will hear you. Turn from your evil ways, and I will heal your land. Step into the river, and I will part the waters. Walk around the city and blow trumpets, and the wall will come down. Believe, and you will be saved. So I don't, I don't keep up with sports the way that I used to, but usually at nighttime before I go to bed, I just like to get on ESPN and see what happened in the world of sports. And, and a, couple, a couple nights ago, I got online and I saw a, a score of a game, and the Clippers lost to the Mavericks by 50 points. In fact, they were down by 50 at halftime. Now, sometimes this happens in high school or college. You get a mismatch. But these, this is a professional-level team, and the Clippers are supposed to be title contenders. But something happened to them in that game. Obviously, they didn't play very well. And, and at some point, when they got down by too many points, they decided that they couldn't win anymore, and it affected the way that they played. Because I don't believe for one second that the Clippers are 50 points worse than the Dallas Mavericks. But that's what, that's what the score told us because at some point in the game, they, they quit believing they could win and it affected their effort. We've got to understand that faith requires belief. If we don't believe that God makes a difference, if we don't believe that, that he's died on the cross and that we win in the end, it affects the way that we live. And I think that faith is a belief that speaks through our actions. James said, listen, you, you, can, you can do faith however you want to, but I'm going to show you my faith by the way that I choose to live. I'm going to show you my faith through my works, through my actions. And to me, faith requires for us to take the first step and to trust God with that step, to have the confidence to trust in his plan, to walk in his way. There's a story in the Bible. There's this guy who's been lame for his whole life. And he's got a few friends, and they're trying to take him to Jesus because they believe that Jesus 
uh, can heal him. And this, this story kind of blows my mind, but obviously they can't get to Jesus. He's in a house, he, he's teaching, that they can't get to him. And I don't understand why one of them couldn't just fight their way in there and ask Jesus to come out for a second, I don't know. But they thought the best plan was, let's, let's go ahead and drag this dude who can't, he can't move. I would have loved to have seen them getting this guy on the roof. They get him on the roof, and then they cut a hole in the roof to lower this guy down to Jesus so that he can be healed. And this is what Scripture tells us. This is what Jesus said to him. Luke 5, 24, he said to the man who could not move his body, I say to you, get up, take your bed, and go home. I mean, think about what Jesus is asking this guy to do. He's asking him to try to do something that he's never done before, and that is stand up. And it's not like he does something to him. It's not like there, all he says is your sins are forgiven. There's no remedy. He doesn't even touch him to our knowledge. And Jesus asked this man to do something in his mind that is impossible. But in order to experience the healing that this man did, he had to have had the courage to try, the courage to take the first step, the courage to listen to Jesus' instruction. And because he did, it allowed him to do the impossible. So I ask us today, do we have that same courage? Do we have the courage to take the first step? But I think part of the problem is, is that we got to figure out what that first step is. What's the one thing you think that Jesus has been nagging in the back of your mind? What's that one thing that you just feel like, man, I, I feel like I should do this, or I've, I've always wanted to do this, or I feel like God has, has pushed me to do this? What, what is it that lays heavy on your heart? What is that one thing that, that you've wanted to do, but you haven't done it? What's that one step you think God might be calling you to try? Maybe, maybe God calling you to let go of something or calling, calling you to fight for something. Can I just say that there's no better time than a new year as we enter 2021 to take the first step of faith? What could it be for you? Could it mean trying to be better about getting into the Word and reading it for yourself? Maybe it's about learning something new. Maybe trying to learn a new language so that you can speak the gospel to somebody. Maybe the first step is, is finding a Bible study or devotional. Maybe you can do by yourself or with a group. Maybe the first step is to seek counseling, maybe marriage counseling or, or maybe counseling for depression. Or maybe the first step for you is just to tell somebody else that you're struggling. Maybe the first step could be finding a way in which you could, you could serve in a ministry. You could help out with the children's ministry. If you're crazy enough, you can come help me out with the youth. Maybe it's about letting go of a bad habit. Maybe it's about going to college or looking for a new job. Maybe the first step for you today is to actually take advantage of the resource that we're providing you today with Right Now Media and to take the opportunity, take the chance to watch some of that stuff together as a family. I think one of the things that I was challenged with this week, and, and Stephanie, it, it, it's just been on her heart to do something for the homeless. And the last, like, three or four times, you know, I don't know if you guys do this, but every time I pass somebody that's on the side of the road, I, I start looking around my car, and I'm like, do, do I have anything that I can give them? Because I, I don't really love to give money to them, because I mean, you don't know what they're going to spend it on. But what would it look like for us as a family to go to Walmart and, and maybe to get together some care packages that we could give out? Like, I feel like that, that's the first step for me. And the first step, guess what? It's going to the store and buying some stuff, and getting some stuff together. But what could it be for you? And I think that through this process, we got to remember that God isn't expecting you to figure it all out. He just wants you to try. He wants you to have the courage and the faith to take the first step, believing that he will see you through, knowing that even, even in failure, that through that failure, he's preparing you for what's ahead. But are you willing to take that step of faith? You know, taking the step of faith is a big deal. But our direction is just as important. We've got to learn to also walk toward God. We've got to learn to walk toward God. I want you to do me a favor this morning, and I want you to raise your hand if you've ever had a goal. Raise your hand if you've ever had a goal. Most of us have had a goal in life, something we want to accomplish in our life. And to me, a goal is a direction. It's something that you work and strive for. It's living with intention to try to make what you want to happen a reality. For example, if, if you want to be debt-free, what do you do? You live differently. You pinch pennies. 
You do whatever you can to, to pay stuff off. You make financial sacrifices. I think you'll understand this. It is counterproductive if you're trying to pay off debt to go out and take more loans and to buy more stuff. Stuff you don't need, right? You guys understand that. And, and to me, this is all to emphasize that direction matters, right? It's not just about taking the first step, but it's also making sure that we're walking toward God. You know, taking the, taking the first step is a huge deal, but we don't want to go in the wrong direction, but we also don't want the fear of going in the wrong direction not to let us start the journey. Because sometimes the first step is important because even if it's in the wrong direction, sometimes by finding the wrong direction, we're able to find the right direction. Sometimes those two steps, they go hand in hand. You don't want fear to stop you, but you want to get started. This means getting involved with God early. It's getting God involved in that process. It's seeking him. It's listening to him and applying. It's going to him for direction. How many of you guys remember who wants to be a millionaire? I, I don't know if I was in middle school or high school, but I remember like when, when that show first came out, it was like a really big deal. Like our whole family would gather around the TV to watch to see if anybody was going to win a million dollars. And the premise of the show, they would ask you 20 questions. They would obviously start easy. They'd get harder. And if you could answer all 20, then you won a million dollars. Now, there was three lifelines that they gave you that you could use to help you out along the way. You could break it down to 50-50. You could pull the audience, which was usually not a good idea. Uh, or you could phone a friend. All right, so think about this. If you're going to go on the show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire?, who are you going to pick as your one person to call? You're not going to look through your life and go, okay, who's the dumbest person I know? You're not going to do that. You're going to do the opposite of that, right? You, you want to pick that, that one person that knows stuff that he, they should know. Like we all have that one person that knows those random facts that he shouldn't or she shouldn't know, right? That's who you want to call. You want to call the person who's going to know the answer, you're going to put the person down that you have faith in, somebody that you trust, somebody that you can go to for direction. Proverbs 3, 5 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Our faith in God becomes evident when we seek, listen, and apply his word. It's not my faith in, in, in myself to be more like him, but it's faith in his ability to change me. It's faith in his ability to show us the right path. Faith in a God who sees the whole path rather than just trusting myself who's, whose sight is limited and trusting that his love will see us through. You know, there's something that happens in the Bible that I really just, I don't understand the process of it. Now Eve, when she's tempted by the snake, the snake comes along and, and creates doubt and lies to her. And she makes a terrible choice, but Eve has access to God. I don't understand why she doesn't go to God to clarify. Say, hey God, somebody's telling me something different and I need, I need you to clarify for me. Because then he could have said, okay, let me explain this to you better. Then if she would have sought, right, then listen, she could have applied it. And can you imagine how things might be different had she listened? To me, this, this all hinges about a, a direction. It's about where we are and how close we are to the Father. It's about proximity and relationship. Do you realize that in that moment, Eve had more faith in Satan than she had in God? And sometimes that's exactly what happens to us. God needs to be that one phone call that we reach out to, that we seek when, when we don't have answers. Something happened the other night that I, I just could not get over this. So I was watching uh, sports, and I was, I was watching all the stuff after the Clemson-Ohio State uh, semifinals playoff college football game. And they're doing a Zoom interview with the Clemson quarterback, Trevor Lawrence. And... This lady, I guess she didn't realize that she wasn't muted. There's somebody else is, is having a conversation with Trevor Lawrence. And then all of a sudden you hear, man, I feel sorry for Trevor. He really needs to shave that mustache. And then the, the lady that's actually talking to him is like, uh, your mic's hot. Might want to be quiet now. Like, really? Like, 
listen, we've been going through COVID long enough now that most of us have been through way more Zoom meetings than we ever wanted to be in. Can we just be honest about that? But most of us by now have figured it out. And this woman is a reporter. She's probably had to do Zoom interviews as her job. Like, you know better. But even if you know how to hit the mute button, guess what? It doesn't matter if you don't push it. It's worthless. It is worthless if you don't push the button. I'm going to say this twice because I want you to hear it. Wisdom becomes stupidity when you choose not to use it. Wisdom becomes stupidity when you choose not to use it. I really believe with all my heart that deep down, Eve knew better. But knowing doesn't matter if you don't apply it. It doesn't matter if you know how to hit the mute button if you don't hit it. Matthew 7, 24 says this, Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. This verse is highlighting the importance of applying what we hear from God. It's not just about being hearers of the word, but about being doers of the word. And that means that we have to think critically about how we apply God's word to our lives. Like when you read the Bible, are you asking yourself, how does this change me? Like, what does it look like to have patience? What does it look like to love my neighbor? And are you taking time to think about what those first steps could be for you? And I just want to provide some help for you today because I think there's two verses that provide us a lot of options for all believers. These are things that we all need to do, and that's 1 Corinthians 13 and Galatians 5, 22 and 23. It's the love chapter, and it's the verse about spiritual fruit. What would look different in our lives if every day we woke up and we took one of those aspects and tried to apply it to our lives? And say, you know what, today I'm going to try to be gentle. Or today I'm going to try to have self-control. Or you know what, today I'm going to try to love, like it says in the book, to keep no records of wrongs, to not be boastful. To just take one of those things and say, I'm going to try to make my life like this today. I'm going to be a patient person today. And if you choose patience, beware. Because God will give you opportunity. But are we thinking about that? Let's take the first step. Let's make sure we're walking toward God. But guess what? Sometimes the road gets hard. We all know this. We've all experienced this. Sometimes the road gets really difficult, but when you want to give up, guess what? We got to keep walking. When you want to give up, keep believing. Now, Rachel and I were talk- texting last night, and we were talking about what the response song should be. And after I wrote this line, I texted her and I said, I really think we should go for Don't Stop Believing by Journey. And she texted back a smiley face. And so I think she thought I was kidding. So I'm afraid to tell you that uh, journey's a no-go today. Um, but, but I want you to understand that this idea of, of faith in God is interwoven with hope. When we talk about the road getting hard, there's nothing we need more than hope. They go hand in hand. I think because of who God is, because of, of what he's done, because of his character, like we come to understand this to be true, that if God is in the situation, there's always hope. There's always hope. He's always going to be there with us. It's this like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego kind of confidence in God that says, even though the fiery furnace is ever before me, I'm going to trust in you. It's it's clinging to to trust in a Savior that may not prevent us from going into the furnace, but he'll go in it with us. And I don't know what furnace is before you today. I I don't have any idea how hot you are from the furnace, but I do know that you're not alone. And I don't think that you've you've got to believe that God doesn't expect you to save yourself. He doesn't expect you to make it through on your own. He just wants you to have enough faith to keep trying, to keep pushing through, to keep walking, to keep taking steps as we lean in him. I want to read Romans 5, 3 through 5. We rejoice in our sufferings, know that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. This idea of having faith in God is pushing through because we know 
that he's not going to leave us or forsake us. We know that everything he's doing is working things for the good of those who love him. Belief that these hardships he's going to use to grow us and strengthen us and prepare us for what's ahead. But I think a lot of times we talk about this at church quite a bit about pushing through our circumstances, about leaning on God and the storm. But sometimes it's more than that. And I kind of want to switch our focus here for this last little bit. Because for me, it's not usually the obstacles in life that make me want to quit. That's not the hard road for me. For me, the hard road is I don't, I don't doubt God's ability. Sometimes I doubt his love for me. Sometimes I allow my brokenness and my failures and my inability to create a pathway of misunderstanding and doubt. And I think Jeremiah would have related well to me. You know, Jeremiah gets sent by God to the potter's house, and he, he has to be a prophet in a time where no one wants to listen to God. And Jeremiah is dealing with kind of with the same thing, and he, he goes down to this potter's house, and, and God says, I just want you to watch and see what the potter does. And a potter tries to build something that doesn't work out, so he mashes it all together, and he starts to create something new. And I wish I, wish I could see and experience the moment where it clicked for Jeremiah when God said, don't you see that in my hands you were just like that piece of clay? You were never too broken that I cannot redeem and use you. In Hebrews 11, there exists a hall of faith. And we're talking to like all, all the big dogs, right? Abraham, Moses, all the heroes and fathers of faith. And in that list is a man named Samson. And to me, that's a little confusing because Samson's story is not great. Uh, you read that story, you're going to have a hard time finding a whole lot that he did right. And so I left asking myself that question. How does Samson get into the hall of faith? How, how does he get in? And then it hit me, and I saw that even after all of his mistakes, even after all his failures, his bad decisions, even after choosing intimacy with Delilah over the blessing of God, even after losing the fight, losing his hair, losing his eyes, losing his pride, at the end, as a prisoner tied to two pillars sitting in shame, after all the brokenness, Samson still believed that God could and would use him. I want to read to you, Judges. 1630. It says, Then Samson bowed with all his strength, and the house fell upon the Lord's and upon the people who were in it. So the dead and whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he killed during his life. Please don't miss this. Samson did more for Israel in one moment than he had done in his whole life. Samson did more out of his weakness than he ever did out of his strength. Because of God. Because that day, tied to those two pillars, he decided to take his faith in himself and put it in God. And that's why he's in the hall of faith. Because he believed that even after all the junk, all the terrible decisions, that God still loved him and that God would still use him. Do you believe that to be true of you? God can still use you. But it's going to be really difficult if you don't believe that. And maybe today you'd be honest enough to say, you know what, Will, I, I've lost a little bit of faith in myself. And maybe part of that is because I've lost my faith in God through this season. And I'm here to remind you today that God has never once lost his faith in you. In a world trying to convince you that you're too broken, I hope that you'll be reminded today that God is a potter. And I know that sometimes the road gets tough, and I know sometimes we fall down. Don't give up. Keep walking. Keep pushing through. Keep trusting. Keep believing. And make sure you take the time to look up. Take a glimpse of the cross of Jesus that you might take your eyes off of yourself and your circumstances, that you might see a Savior that nailed your shame to the cross so that through faith, through your belief, that you might find life. What's your first step? What direction are you going? Don't give up. Rachel's going to sing this song for us called Make Room. 
And afterward, we're going to pray over the elements and we're going to take those together. And if you haven't had a chance to get communion there in the tables in the back, I just hope that as you hold those elements today, you understand what's been done for you. You think about what the step God took. And I think that it's kind of cool to think about that as the last step that Jesus took. But it should lead to our first step. Jesus got on the cross and he dealt with our sin and our shame and all of our junk. But then he does something kind of crazy. He calls us to the cross as well. He says, it's time to pick up your cross. It's time to grab it, take the first step. If you're going to believe in me, sometimes it's walking an uncomfortable road. But you got to keep going. Rachel, would you lead us? Here is where I lay it down. Every bird and every crown. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down. Every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender. you to go ahead and if you haven't already go ahead and peel that wrapper back before we pray I hope you realize that Samson and Jeremiah their story is not that different from yours and I hope that as you hold these elements you look and see that God allowed himself to be broken so that your brokenness could be remade and we take this for a reason. We take this to do this in remembrance of that. A remembrance that our sin and our shame doesn't disqualify us anymore. But that we've got an opportunity to be remade by the King. Pray with me. Father God, thank you so much. As I stand here holding this bread and this juice, I think about your body that was broken, your blood that was poured out so that I could have life. Not so that I could live here on this planet longer, but so that one day when death takes me, I get to be with you forever. No more brokenness, no more tears, no more shame, no more garbage. Just worshiping and basking in your glory. And Lord, I know that there's a lot of us here today, we've been walking a hard road. And I just pray that this, this time, these, these elements be a reminder of hope a reminder of who we have access to, a reminder of who we can make a phone call to. Lord, and I pray that for a lot of us, as we take these elements, you kind of reveal to us what that first step needs to be. And I pray, Father God, that you would help us walk closer to you. 
We love you. We praise you. Thank you so much for giving everything so that we could have everything. In your name, amen. I just want to say thank you guys uh, so much. Uh, I think if, if this year has taught us anything, it is just that each moment we get together is precious. And so that's what this is for us today. And just want to remind you the offering boxes are in the back. I want to also just put it to you, please go out and try the Right Now Media. I think that it's really going to bless you, especially if you have uh, kids like I do that are, that are Malin's age. Uh, there are cartoons aplenty on there. And what, what better way than for a kid to get to watch a little bit of TV, because they love that, you know they do, but actually learn something about Jesus and grow in their faith. What a blessing that is. We hope that it'll bless you. We hope that you'll take advantage of that. Uh, but thank you so much for being here today. In a second, the ushers are going to come and dismiss us by row. Uh, but thank you so much. We love you. Go with God. You're dismissed.